All right, so at two o'clock on our end, it's so great to see so many of you on this call. And I just wanted to start with this will be recorded and we will be sending it out tomorrow. So if you miss anything or want to share it with one of your colleagues, we will be recording this and sending it out tomorrow. So I know a few of you are still, I'll give a second for the rest to connect audio. Let me see if you still jumping in here and people still coming in from the waiting room. But give it just a minute for that. And while we get, if you guys have any questions, you can put them in the chat, you can send them to me directly, or you can send them to me via email as well. But all right, well, I will get started and introduce Elizabeth Burroughs. If you do not, not, will not know Elizabeth, she graduated magna cum laude from DePaul University with a degree in political science and communication where she studied abroad at Oxford University. She went on to receive her doctor of jurisprudence from Indiana University Maurer School of Law in Bloomington. Elizabeth worked at the Indiana State Department of Health as the director of the State Office of Rural Health, where she more than tripled the amount of federal funding for critical access hospitals. Elizabeth then returned to her hometown of Cayuga, Indiana, to start up and serve as the founding CEO of Valley Professionals Community Health Center, which for 1,000% in the eight years she served as CEO. In 2014, Elizabeth started her own business, Burroughs Holding, where she has assisted numerous rural health clinics, fully qualified health centers, institutions of higher education, Federal Access Hospitals, Rural Health Associations, and other nonprofits attain over 280 million in grant funding and over 300 million in enhanced Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement and 340 shared savings. She has worked with healthcare facilities in over 35 states. Together with her team of 14, she generates over seven figures per year while maintaining over 65% profitability. She is a graduate of the Luger Series of Excellence in Public Service, received the Governor's Award for Tomorrow's Leaders, is a National Rural Health Association Rural Health Fellow and was given the DePaul University Alumni Community Leadership Award. Elizabeth was named a fellowship fellow for the National Leadership Academy of Public Health and is a member of the Indiana State Bar Association. She resides near her family farm in Indiana and enjoys spending time with her husband, Steve, and daughters, Eleanor, age 13, and Amelia, age 11. Together, the four of them enjoy traveling and visiting Indiana and historic sites. So I will now turn it over to Elizabeth for a presentation on grants. All right, well, hello, and thank you for sharing an hour of your time with me today. I know how precious time is, and as we try to get started with the new year, I know everything is really busy and everyone's in full force, and I hope that you are in full force thinking about grants and how you can bring funding to your organization. And today's goal, typically I'm always talking about healthcare, and all the examples that I will use, of course, will be about healthcare because that has been uh, about where about 90% of my grant writing is involved. But um, as we introduce some other opportunities, um, think about ways that you can get grants for, again, I've gotten grants to send my daughter's band to the Peach Bowl last year where they got to play um, in the Peach Bowl parade and watch um, the National Football Ch College Football Championship. Um, and you may think of other ideas too, of ways that you can help your local community. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces and also some new faces. So um, we'll get started. If you have heard me speak before, as I tell everyone, um, a goal is that we always provide a new nugget of information. My family are big Chick-fil-A fans. We eat there all the time and we always love their chicken nuggets. So I hope that you walk away with a nugget, a new nugget of information that you can use, whether that's in hopefully in your day-to-day -day life as through your profession through your own business, or again, through a volunteer position or a role that you have assumed. So again, we just want to get the year started with grants. And I just want to say props to my team and I. Last year, we brought in over $127 million in grants. I keep saying over $100 million and they keep correcting me. $127 million in grants alone um, in 2023. And some of those applications were still out. So we're still waiting to hear. And in enhanced reimbursement, somewhere around $400 million in enhanced reimbursement from Medicaid, Medicare, and um, the 340B drug program. There's just not easy ways to track that. We're working on it. <clears throat> so um, when I start, I always tell people about my first grant and people come up to me years later at a conference and they start saying, I know you, you're the Gates Foundation lady. And I love being known as that, but here's my story. I was 19 and working for USDA Rural Development. And during that time, um, one of my projects my hometown of KU, Indiana, was named one of the worst three in the entire country. So USDA named three horrible small towns and said, we're going to infuse some resources and money into them. 
And they infused resources to hire me to work as a summer intern all through college and as a, a cooperative education student to do a variety of things, which included grant writing. So at 19, I was upset because there was no internet anywhere in my local area. So it was the year 2000 and I had nowhere to access. There weren't coffee shops. There weren't places you could go. And of course, my dad's farm did not have internet access. Still doesn't to this day. And so I thought I'm going to get a grant. I found a grant from a place called the Gates Foundation, which was not as large as it is now. But I found a grant where you could apply for internet at public places. And so I wrote a grant to put computers and internet in the local libraries in Vermillion County, Indiana. And I received it and was able to go put the computers in and set up the internet and use that myself. And I was so excited about that, that ever since then grants have been a part of my life and I've continued to write grants because I got to see the true success of that. And that all happened this one summer. And I also worked throughout the school year and through the fall. And at Christmas break, I went back and I was back to working full time for USDA. And I went to the libraries and I thought, I'm going to watch all these young people using the computers. And I was completely wrong with who was using that grant. It was a lot of senior citizens who were retired that had heard of this great thing called the Internet to do their Christmas shopping on. And so that was my first round of success was to think, oh, my goodness, I'm watching all these people do their Christmas shopping um, there at Christmas break. And it was awesome to see these senior citizens using the Internet for the first time. And I think that's why we all want to write grants, right, is we want to make a difference in our communities. We want to have an impact. And I hope, too, that once you get your first grant and maybe you already have that you will become addicted to it, just like I have. Um, and why do I keep doing this and what makes me keep going with grants when there are so many deadlines and so much stress and now you've got to use a different portal and you have to use a certain font and you've got to write about sustainability and create a logic model and a budget and now you have to have a four year budget, not just a one year budget and there's all these new requirements and you think what makes me keep going, why do I keep doing this. And again, it is that we want to see a difference in our own community. We want to see a positive impact that we're having on this world. And I guarantee you can have that with grants. And everyone in the world, everybody gets excited for grants. But then how many of you have experienced when it comes to actually writing the grants, you have little to no help, right? Everyone's willing to pass it off to someone who has experience with grants, but no one really ever wants to um, start that on their own. So again, since 2014, my company, we've got over 280 million in grant funding. And before that, I had secured 25 million for the organizations that I previously worked for. So I've had a lot of experience in grants, much of that in healthcare, but again, also in just community development and basic things to help my kids in their programs as well. So again, many of you know me and have reached out through Burroughs Consulting, which we work with rural health clinics, federally qualified health centers, critical access hospitals, rural hospitals, and others. And through that, we start with the grant process. We help with grant research and finding grants. Once you have your wish list, all the way through grant management and making sure that you're spending your, your grants properly. Um, and again, we mainly work with healthcare entities. But I also have another business that many people don't know about, and that's called Grant Genius. And I've had so many people ask me, do you teach people how to write grants? Can you teach me? Can you help me write a grant? How do we do this? I don't even know how to get started. And so that is exactly why I started Grant Genius two or three years ago. And to be honest, many of you know, I am a go-getter. When I start something, I see it through beginning to end. And I started this and then really lost momentum because I was so busy writing grants day in and day out. But I am back to it. And as the response we've seen today and through our large number of registrations, um, people want to learn how to write grants themselves. And I want to be able to help offer that. So Grant Genius is a company that we're starting to help teach people how to write grants. So if you have interest in that or would like to get on our list, sir, or you'd be interested in future grants, just let us know. And everyone on this will be notified of the full course if you are interested. But today I'm going to give you a big overview for free and enjoy it. And then if you have interest or know someone that should take the full course, we would love to know about them. So today in lesson one, what are we going to be learning? Um, we're going to learn how to find your why, identify what makes you or your organization stand out. Where do we get started? Right. That's the hardest part. I will tell you that. So we're going to tackle that. How do we utilize networks and partnerships? 
writing out the story, and then post-award managing the grants and next steps. So this is what we're going to try to cover in an hour, and um, I'll try to be cognizant of everybody's time and, and wrap up, but we want to make sure that you do have a good overview so that if all of a sudden it falls into your lap or yesterday as I was um, running a health center and I was volunteering someone or volunteering them and kind of telling them as the boss, hey, you can take this on. Many of us, that's how we came into grant writing was being volunteered to do that. You are going to be ready to be able to take this challenge on. So first, you have to know your why. Why do you want to do this, right? Because grant writing is similar to filling out a job application or a college application. And let's be honest, none of us enjoy that, right? That's all pain. Nobody wants to go through an application or, you know, many federal grants, the, the, just the instructions are 80 to 100 pages alone. So we have to know why we want to do it, or we're going to sit there and we're going to close up shop and never think of writing a grant again, because it's a little daunting. So what I always go back to is you have to know your why. And these three pictures represent my why. So those are my daughters right at the beginning of COVID when we had Easter church at home. They're all dressed up for Easter that day. And I want them to be able to access the best quality health care right in our hometown. And that is actually the clinic where we attend, which is a federally qualified health center. And then you see Mayo Clinic's logo and you go, Elizabeth, what does this have to do with anything? Um, Mayo Clinic has saved my life due to my personal battle with Crohn's disease. And I am blessed and lucky enough to be able to have medical care at Mayo Clinic annually and sometimes more than annually, but I definitely make the trek to Rochester, Minnesota at a minimum of every 12 months to keep all my Crohn's um, in a good place. And I am a, a happy, healthy individual thanks to Mayo Clinic. And I will credit them with that. They literally saved my life. But that access is only because I had high quality health care, that I had the right insurance and I was able to pay for that care and also be able to get to Rochester, Minnesota from rural Indiana. And until my kids have that kind of health care, Mayo Clinic care right in our hometown of Cayuga, Indiana, I am going to keep on doing this. This is why I do grants, because I'm so passionate about health care and I want everyone to have that same passion. You may not be passionate about the same reason. Mayo Clinic may not be part of your story, but you have to know your why. Maybe you are passionate about getting someone high ed, you know, higher education. Maybe your passion is a clean environment. It doesn't matter what your passion is. Making sure you know that is going to be important as you sit down to write grants. Because if you're going to try to write a healthcare grant, you're like, I don't care about healthcare. I don't care if anyone even has access to it. Who cares? We're all fine. That. You know, it's not going to be a fun experience, so you may as well hang up your grant writing um, hat right now. But if you do know your why and you're passionate about what you're going to write about, and maybe that is getting internet at your local libraries, maybe that is people having access to a computer, maybe it is people having access to high quality health care, then that's great. Why do you want the money? Why are you or your organization a good investment? Why do you want to do this? Maybe a different reason for everyone, and there's no right or wrong, but why do you want to do it? Why is there a need for this? And why will your idea or proposal solve the problem? And if you haven't noticed, I've really taken you through. These are going to be most of the elements you're going to write into that grant application. Um, you need to know why you want to do it, but you also need to know why your proposal is going to be the best and going to you know, um, rise up to the top as we all want. As I said in the intro, this is the hardest part, right? Getting started, where do I start? What can I do, right? When we sit down, it's overwhelming. You have either you're logging into uh, maybe a new portal, Benevity portal where all these foundations use, or you're logging into a new state portal and you've had to go through five levels of permission to even access the grant application, or you're sitting down to read the notice of funding opportunity that, like I said, you printed off and you wasted you know, 110 sheets of paper, whatever it is, you're, it's a little daunting. Where do I start? So what I suggest is before you even find a grant opportunity, you start working through these elements. This is something you can do today. You may not have even identified a potential funder or funding opportunity, but you can start working through this. What makes you proud of your clinic or organization or entity? Then there's something that makes you proud, right? You work there. There is something that you are proud and you are excited about. And what makes you different? Um, it's it every it never fails uh, to amaze me about what makes communities different. Um, I live right on the Indiana Illinois state line, and I live close to Danville, Illinois, and that is the home of Dick Van Dyke. And these people are so proud of it, as well they should be. He's awesome, um, but 
they they promote that. You know, write that down. That makes Danville, Illinois different, right? They produced, they also produced three astronauts that have went to the space. So promote that. I mean, you may think, well, that's not important. That doesn't matter about internet. Well, it might. Think about what makes you, your clinic, your organization, and even your area different. And do you offer special services? Maybe you don't even know what you're doing is special, but it might be. Do you offer after school services that no one else is doing, led by um, led by a teacher and co-led by a speech pathologist? That's different. You're doing something unique. What makes you different? Do you have any success stories? We all know we do, and our organizations are doing amazing things. So what, what makes your healthcare organization different or just your organization in general? Do you have success stories? <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was writing for the band, we talked about how um, the previous year, the band had had five members. And because they were able to go on this trip to the Peach Bowl, they had grown to 35 members, which was a huge increase, especially in a school that only has 300 people total. So over 10% of the population was in band versus before it was less than 1%. That's a success story. Tout that. I understand some marching bands may sound better than their marching band, but we were able to tout their growth and that they're really working for that. So again, continue looking. What are your success stories? And I guarantee you have them. And if you're new to the organization, use this as a way to have a coffee break with someone that's been there for 30 years. Ask them the success stories. If you're a state organization, when you go visit your hospitals and clinics, sit down and say, you know, I'd love to hear one of your success stories. It's amazing what you hear and what you can see. What makes your town, county, state special? We talked a little bit about that. But again, I know that you have great things happening, so use that. And, you know, do you offer any unique services through specialized staff? Are you doing anything differently? Sometimes that's even asking someone outside the organization that isn't working in it day to day. But, you know, what do we do differently? Why do you come here? Why do you work here? You know, and get people's stories. That's going to be really, really powerful as you're starting to make notes. And again, Keep in mind, all this is really before you've even found a potential grant to apply for. If you can do all this background work, I guarantee this investment in time is going to pay off dividends when you sit down to write the grant. <clears throat> so how do you get started? And every grant writer has their own methods. Um, but one thing that keeps all grant writers, I've never met a grant writer that doesn't have every color of pen, Sharpie, post it and has everything color coded, right? That's what makes us all, all in common. This is my cup of ambition. And look, it's got about every color, every type of highlighter, every color in it, because as I'm sitting down to write a grant, that's important. I've got to be ready to have everything organized and set up the way I want it set up. For me, one little trick, and again, this may be the negative information you take, anything having to do with money is highlighted in green and green post it. So that's my budget area. So then I know when I put that, that large notice of funding opportunity um, or notice of announcement of award in my binder, I'm going to be able to find the budget information because I know that's where my boss is going to ask me about first, or that's what my client's going to ask about first. How do we have to spend the money? So I've got that right to green. That's just one of my little tricks. Everybody has their own little things. You'll develop your own. Trust me, you may already have your own tricks. If so, feel free to share those in the chat. That would be awesome. Share your little your little notes. I, you know, maybe you do every logic model bit of information is always in pink, those types of things. Whatever it is, that would be awesome. Make sure you have your wish list. And what I mean by a wish list is you know what your organization wants to go after. You never want to sit down and not know what you want to seek, or you just think, well, here's money for this project. So I'm just going to. I'll, oh, there's money out for a mobile clinic. And you can see my little mobile clinic here in my background. I'm going to go after a mobile clinic. But that was not part of your strategic plan. That wasn't anything your board of directors has ever talked about. That wasn't any goal that you had. That makes no sense. You want to have your wish list and know what you're working toward before. Then you go and seek funding opportunities to match that. If you already had sought and knew that you had a need for a mobile clinic to go into rural areas, that makes perfect sense. Then when you find that grant, you want to go after that. But you always want to make sure that you're not just seeking funds, but that you're following your own wish list and your strategic plan. And then you're finding grants to meet those needs. <clears throat> you also want to make sure you have time. You see all the clocks. 
I've had people call me and yes, I think my record, I've written a federal grant from cover to cover without even starting before within six days. That's not something that is not a best practice. And I do not advise you ever try that. I've done it twice, both of which were funded. That's not a good example to share because you really need adequate time. You want to have time to plan. You want to be thinking through, you know, your sustainability plan. You want to be thinking through the entire application. You want to be able to implement, have your implementation plan ready. So again, you don't want to just wait and think, oh, I literally had somebody call me on a Friday recently, a hospital, and they wanted me to write a grant that was due Monday at 5 p.m. And I had to lovingly say no. They said, well, we're going to do it ourselves then. And I said, well, good luck. I wish you all the best. But again, that is not enough time to write a grant that's really going to be competitive. So you want to make sure you've done your background work and you have the time in place to be able to do a competitive application. None of us, we, none of us have enough time, right? That's the thing we're all, we all are given equal amounts of and nobody has enough time. So you definitely do not want to waste time writing a grant that's not going to be successful. You want to put your heart and soul into something that's going to be a success and going to get funded. Again, can you do it? I told you two examples that I've written in six days, but that's not a best practice. You also need your heart. You have to care about it. And whatever team that you are involving in this process, you want to make sure they care about it too. You don't want to just be doing this. This is our last resort. We don't care. We don't really want to do that project, but I mean, we'll go ahead and write a grant. It's going to show through to the grant. <clears throat> Maybe you've interviewed someone and you tell, can tell right off the bat whether they want the job or not, right? It becomes very, very evident from the beginning. The same is going to be when your reviewers read that grant. They're going to be able to tell if you really care, if you really want to make this happen. So you need, again, the heart, the organization materials, the time, and to make sure that you have your wish list and that it goes along with what you want. When we sit down to work with a client, the first thing that we ask is what is on your wish list? It may be items, people, projects, um, what's your needs, potential solutions to those needs. And that forms the wish list because, again, those are the things that's exactly what you want to be finding funding for. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm dealing with this post holiday, um, a little bit of illness and losing my voice. So I'm trying to make sure that um, you guys can hear me through. So I apologize. You want to make sure, too, that the new thing is most grants are asking for partnerships and not just letters of support, but they want full memorandums of understanding or agreement about how you're going to work together. They want plans for how you're going to work together. Sometimes they even want like grant governing entities or a grant planning committee to show who all is involved. But almost everyone loves to get funding through networks and partnerships. And everybody loves public private partnerships. Are you working with a private foundation and also get it leveraging federal dollars? Are you able to get state dollars? And again, free bit of information here. Always check with the grant regulations to make sure any of that's allowed and what's allowed for match. I'm not speaking to what is allowable or not. I'm just telling you what funders like to see, and that is networks and partnerships. So make sure you network with high level people. And what I didn't put on this slide, but what else I'm going to say is low level people. I want everybody to hear about the great things that I'm doing and what my clients are doing. So network, share information, talk to anyone that's going to willing to hear it. You know, I put always have your elevator pitch ready. I always know exactly what my clinics are doing, what they want to be going after. So have that ready. And you want to have that ready for your organization, the clients you're representing or anyone that you're writing a grant for. Also, you know, use your local resources. I tell people all the time, go to your small business development centers, call your local USDA. We talk about chambers of commerce, EDAs, your local congressional offices. These people are there to meet with you and to help you and to assist you. Make sure that you are not um, someone that they have no idea who you are. And then that way, when that funding opportunity becomes available, they're going to be coming right to you. Um, USDA is a pri prime example. They want to meet with people before they fund them, and they also work with them throughout the funding process. Um, <clears throat> there are many other funders similar to that. The United Way wants to know you. Local community foundations want to know you. Also, make sure you have partnerships. 
um, you know, I've learned, I learned a lot from my clients that we work with. And I kind of laughed to myself when someone said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to get a letter from our local Lions Club, Optimist and Rotary. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, great. We'll include them, but we might be at page limit. Is that really going to be worthwhile? I will tell you that's something that the federal government highlighted as something that was really strong is that the local community was behind it because they could see that because there were letters written from the president of the local optimist, Rotary, et cetera. So that was a great idea. Again, I learned that from my client. <clears throat> Another example, um, there is a library Bill, I believe it's in Oklahoma or Nebraska that USDA funded, and they actually framed one of their letters of support. And it was from actually a homeschool student who was using the library to help assist with his schooling. And he wrote a letter, and that's actually framed in that library to this day. I have not seen it, but I've heard the story and heard multiple USDA reps use that as an example. So again, those partnerships, people are going to use it. Also think of unlikely friends. When I began in the federally qualified health center world, a lot of times critical access hospitals and FQHCs didn't get along. And because we did, we were able to secure millions of dollars from, for our local area because we were so unique because we were able to work together and get along. So again, think of unlikely partnerships and um, networks. Also, those will pay off dividends. Sometimes there are certain grants that you can only write if people work there. I give the example a lot because I'm, I'm a Hoosier, so I know the Lilly Endowment. Most people know Eli Lilly and Company. But again, there are this many grants that you can apply for if you just go online to Eli Lilly. But if you know somebody that works there and have connections to people that work at Eli Lilly or Elanco, there are this many grants you can apply for. A lot more doors are open. So keep thinking and making partnerships um, to improve your chances. <clears throat> now... And keep in mind, this may not even be with a notice of funding opportunity. It may be and it may not be, but you can start writing out your story. We Maybe you have a three-day weekend this weekend. Start writing out your story on Monday. Get your organization words down. T talk about what you want to do. These will be things that you can use for all kinds of future grants. So write out you and your organization's story. Make sure you state your elevator pitch to your committee. And by grant committee, that might just be a committee of one. It might be you. For me, I might be explaining the need to my whole team. You may have an internal committee at your organization that you're working on. For when I was writing for the band, it, there were a group of mom, us parents, moms and dads that I think were called the band, band supporters or something like that. And we were the ones that presented things to each other. So again, make sure you have your elevator pitch and your story to your committee. And then, and I cannot state how important this is, when you write out your story, have someone that knows nothing about it, read it and ask you questions. Now, I'm not necessarily saying proofread it. <clears throat> I'm saying have someone who knows nothing about your organization, what you're trying to do, your entity, read it and then ask you questions because they're going to be the ones that really, those are the types of reviewers you have and they're going to bring up things that you don't even think about. Sometimes we know our organizations and our entities so well, we don't even think of the need to define what is a critical access hospital. Duh, everybody knows that. No, not everybody knows that. Maybe not everybody knows what a federally qualified health center is. These are who we work with all the time. Maybe not everybody knows what FPL is, federal poverty level. Maybe not everybody knows what rural and urban even mean. And there are different rural and urban definitions across the country with all kinds of different funders. So again, make sure you have someone who does not know anything, read it and ask you questions. And then you need to reread your story with an open and clear mind when you're not being interrupted. And oftentimes, yes, I'm a dork, sit there and read it out loud because it sounds different when you're reading it out loud than when you're just reading it on the screen. And always go back to why are you wanting to write grants? I can do all this and go through all these steps when I am so passionate about everyone in my community getting access to high quality health care. I will do this all day because it's my why. Going back to your why and remembering why you want to do this and going through all your steps is going to be vitally important. This is also important. And I will say this is where a lot of people start. And keep in mind, we've already went through, what, four or five steps before we even get to this part. 
So I just want to remind everybody, this is not where you start. This is where most people want to start. You've already got your story written out. You already know your why. You've already got success stories. You've already got partners in place. All those things are all the background. That's capacity building. But this is gathering the necessary information. This is going to be a lot easier if you've done all these other steps. So gathering the necessary information. Who do you need to meet with within your organization? Who has access to the grants.gov password? Who has the budget approval? Who within, you know, is it is it state government? Is it county government? Do the commissioners have to approve it? Does someone at the state level have to approve it? You know, make sure you know all that and you think of through that. Also, always why. Why do you want the money? How are you going to use the money? And how are you going to track and oversee that all the things you say are going to happen are actually going to happen? And that is becoming more and more important. And the more detailed you can share about your oversight and tracking, the, the better off you're going to be. What are the intended outcomes and when is this going to be implemented? Again, the more detailed you can be, the better. People get hung up. Well, when, what day is it going to be funded? And, and when is it, you know, I don't know the exact date. Well, put, you know, 60 days from grant award date, we will be able to do this. 90 days from grant award date, we will be able to do this. So again, you are getting the details. You have a full implementation plan. How will this be carried out? How's it going to be fulfilled? And who are the personnel responsible? And a lot of people get hung up. Well, people change staff. Well, what if someone moves? What if someone leaves? Somebody might retire. Somebody might be getting a new position. People, I, all funders understand we're in the middle of a great resignation. We are in the middle. People change jobs. Things are overturned. People move around. That's okay. But the fact that you already have people that you're going to put responsible responsibilities under makes it look like you have a stronger proposal. So again, if you don't take anything else away, that may be an important takeaway for you today. in developing a grant plan and timeline. These are just some tidbits of information. You may talk to another grant writer who gives you different bits of information. I don't think anybody would disagree with me, but everybody has their own little tricks. These are just some of my tricks that I use with my team, so I'm going to share them. And again, feel free to share your tips and tricks in the chat so we can share them with everybody at the end of this presentation. But make sure you enlist a proofreader early in the process. You don't wait till grants due in 24 hours and call somebody, hey, can you proofread this? They're in a hurry and they have no time. You want to make sure that you ask somebody in advance, hey, I've got a grant due in three months from now. So I've got a grant due March 10th. Would you be willing that mar that week before then to be able to say around March 3rd through 8th to be able to do some proofreading? Could you hold some time in your calendar? You want to get someone early. Make sure you set your deadline. And this is what I'm going to say. You know, thou shalt not lie. I agree with that. Lie about your deadline to other people. Tell your team before it's due because you cannot be waiting until the last day to submit. Something will go wrong with the portal, with the mail, with however you have to submit, hand deliveries. I've, I've got stories, every story under the book as to why something goes wrong the last day. So we always tell people never wait till the last day. Set the deadline, make a fake deadline four days before. So maybe even a week before. Tell people, make up deadlines. If you've got to get letters of support, tell them two weeks before. They may not know the actual deadline, but say you have to get things in. In other words, I'm not saying to lie about the deadline, but make up pre preliminary deadlines so you are able to meet your larger federal deadline. Because there is nothing worse than when you're waiting and you're watching and the time's ticking away and you may not be able to submit a grant, or you're trying to reach people at 11 o'clock at night, Eastern time, and you're trying to work over four different time zones, and you're trying to get approvals and everything like that. It is extremely stressful, and you never want to have to go through that. Trust me, I've been in that position numerous times. You do not want to be there. Make sure you have a list of items that you need from others within your organization or your community so you know who you need to be asking favors of, and this is not going to say it on the slide, but after you get that, make sure you thank them. If they provide a letter of support, shoot them a thank you note. When you go pick it up, you know, give them a hundred grand candy bar and say, I really hope we get this hundred grand. Thanks for your help or whatever it is that you want to do. Please make sure you keep those partners and you do thank the people that are helping you because that does often go unnoticed. And you know, you've already got your story written. You've already written out your story. So make sure you start reviewing that and working that into the grant. 
write out your story, find out what must be discussed and start elaborating on that. Divide tasks. And again, you want to start writing as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> the sooner you can start a draft, the better. Honestly, you know, if you can start working on prior grants, I mean, there's people that, and we work with a lot of clients, they've already been eyeballing certain grants. They already have drafts ready of grants that have not even been announced yet. And those are, those are going to be some of your competitors. So you want to be ready. You want to start writing as soon as you can. Also, if you know every year the community foundation gives out money or your state gives out money for these certain things, start writing now. Use last year's or the previous term's um, guidance and start writing that grant up. They're probably not going to change it dramatically. You'll be ahead of the game. Now outlining the grant. <clears throat> and a lot of this is just what I've already said. It's just making sure you've you've done all those things. So type out the grant outline, make sure you have others to help you. I'm a person, it's funny because every grant writer has certain um, sections that they write first. I usually write federal grants, those are my favorite. I always start with governance or I start with resources and capabilities. The one I hate doing the most is needs. That's my weakest part, I'm not a data person. And so that's always what I leave till the last. So guess what I have learned? I'm going to enlist others to help me on the needs section because I know I always leave it to last. So I must not enjoy that. So I'm going to write that last. I love sustainability plans. So I'm always going to do that first. There's people that love logic models. Start looking at what are people's strengths and working on that. Make sure you have facts, you have stories, and you have supporters. And you're working those into your narrative. That's highly important. Fill in every line possible. Even if it's not applicable, state that it's not applicable. Make sure you address every single element. Whether it's a foundation grant, a federal grant, you have to write it into the narrative and you say, you know, this is only for uh, Native American tribes not applicable. Okay, then write that. Make sure they know that you have addressed every single thing. Make sure you include every attachment and when you can, always meet with the grantor. This is more important with foundations and someone asked me recently when I did a class, they said, how do you meet with grantors or how do you get people to meet with you? I'm like, I don't know, find, find your funders and start most, a lot of foundations or United Ways or whatever, have dinners, buy a ticket to their dinner, show up, go talk to people, email someone, you know, friend them on LinkedIn, ask them to do a virtual copy with you so you can learn more about their organization, aka you're going to tell them about your organization. You know, anything you can do to get your word out and to show up places, start doing that. And then I put, you know, either listen to the grant calls or review the online FAQs because sometimes grant notices do change. So make sure you do that and you keep doing that throughout the grant process. There have been times deadlines have changed. There's times attachment names have changed. So always make sure that you're on top of that. <clears throat> managing the grant. So then we've gotten funded. Now what do we do? And this is the part many people forget. You want to make sure that you respond to your funder if they call, email, or reach out. You have no idea how many times as a consultant, because I'm on the grants.gov entity, I get called because they have called somebody who's gotten a grant and no one at the organization has returned the call. We've had people that no one within an organization has returned an email from a foundation. You think, well, this is basic. I agree that it's basic, but make sure that you are responding to your funders. Make sure you look and determine how the funds are to be distributed and they are distributed accordingly. And make sure appropriate individuals in your organization understand the grant terms. You have no idea how many times we've written a grant for a client and all of a sudden the CEO says, well, we don't need money for this site. We're going to put it over at this county instead. No, you can't do that. Maybe you can, it might be fine, but you have to check the terms of the grant. You have to make sure you're managing that appropriately. Just because they're the CEO of your organization or the board chair now, instead of you know, offering primary care, now they wanna offer behavioral health care. Instead of sending the band to the Peach Bowl, they're gonna send the band to Washington, DC. It may be fine, but you have to check with your funders. And make sure you give credit to your funders. Make sure you write a thank you note. Do they want recognition? Do they want press? Do they want to be recognized? Make sure you do that accordingly. 
Recently, I've read numerous articles where 98% of foundations have never received a thank you note. I will tell you, I took around thank you, uh, thank you board pictures with from my daughter's band. Almost everybody has them up in their community or in their building, in their um, business. Do you think when I go back to ask for funding in another two or three years, they're going to be more likely to because I have a big thank you with the picture of the band? Of course they are. And again, even if I've donated to, to kid organizations or whatever, when somebody comes back with a thank you, you're always willing to give again. So make sure you do follow through on that. Now, I am not saying you want to show up at a government building with a bunch of donuts and coffee and try to, you know, bring them breakfast and win them over. No, because that's asking people to potentially violate their own rules. You can't do that. You want to make sure you do things within the rules, but most everybody can take a thank you email or a written thank you note. Now is the big grant season. I always say January through May or June are when most grants are announced. And so this is when we do most of our writing. Be ready. Here are some places to look for grants. And there's many, many more places. But I will tell you, we use grants.gov. And you can look at the forecasted federal grants. Keep in mind, it's a forecast, right? We all look at weather forecasts. Are they exactly right? Not necessarily. But... Many times they are right. So look at the forecast and start being ready. I have tried about six different databases for foundation um, and local funding research. And our favorite is instrumental. You can get a free 14 day trial and get money off if you want to use this code or go to instrumental, go on their website, try it out. We have had great luck in finding funding we've never, ever found for people before. They also have easy access to tax form 990s and people's websites. So you can look at exactly what that foundation has funded before. So you put yourself in the best position to get funding. And one that I re refer to most of my healthcare entities, Rural Health Information Hub, and they send out funding opportunities. Also, if you start looking and signing up, you can start signing up for various listservs for foundations in your area, go to the United Way, Go to, you know, look up foundations, Kansas City, Missouri, if that's where you're looking for funding and sign up for their emails. One thing do not do because it will stress you out going down the Google rabbit hole for grants. If you just Google grants for, uh, you know, community gardens, oh my, you could spend the next hundred hours and still not find what you want to find. I mean, you may and great, but I will tell you, my team spent a lot of wasted time doing things like that. But if I go on instrumental and look up community gardens and can put in a geographic location and a time frame, I'm going to be able to find something that is worthwhile for me. And so I will tell you, I, I love Google. I use it every day, but I don't use it to go find grants just willy nilly. This is what I want to find funding for. Also, again, a nugget of information, look where your entity is spending money or partners you work with and look at their foundations. If you're a doctor's office and you're sending a lot of x-rays to a hospital, go look at that hospital foundation. You might be spending a lot with a certain organization where you buy all your supplies. Do they have grant funding? Um, also, just be on the lookout everywhere. Who's been to Aldi's, Target, Walmart? I don't know. I'm assuming you have those in their area. Meyer. All of those people give out grants all the time, right? I can tell you off the top of our head, I have gotten grants or written for grants from those entities. Every bank has grant entities. Every electric company has to give a certain amount back in grants. So again, just start looking around and you really, really will find a lot of opportunities. Okay, good. I think we're about exactly on time, Hannah. So we have some time uh, for questions if any have came in to you, or again, you can write them in the chat or unmute yourself if you have questions. I would love to answer those. And this is my contact information. If I don't respond to you within 48 hours, bug me again. It's because I've gotten overwhelmed with something or maybe I'm in the middle of finishing a federal grant and I can't see the light of day as we've all been there if you've written any federal grants before. But feel free to email me or call me anytime. I love hearing from you. And most importantly, if you actually write a grant and get it, please tell me. I'm still on a high from last year when I did a workshop at a state conference and they somebody wrote back and said, based on your workshop, I was able to find a grant and I wrote it and got it. I'm also still on a high from a hospital in Indiana where I taught this course to the Indiana Hospital Association members and someone was able to get a large grant um, to help address um, high rates of suicide in their community. So 
again, uh, and, and to combat and uh, provide mental health resources there. So I love to hear those success stories. So if you were able to take any bit of information, ever get a grant, please write me later because it will just make my day. Trust me. So Hannah, do we have any questions? Yes, we've had a lot come through. So we'll see what we can get through in the next 15 minutes. But first, how do you make sure all the details are captured in the RFP? Explain your process for review, Can This is where I try to have someone who really has no idea what is going on with this grant. Someone who hasn't written it, hasn't been working on it. If you can have someone who does understand the grant process. So we have a big enough team now. I'm really lucky to have somebody look over it. But I will tell you, when my business started, it was me sitting on a couch by myself with my one and three-year-old running around. So I can tell you when I did it then and with writing grants, I made my husband, um, who was a college professor, look at things and, and check it. Um, I've made my mom review grants. So again, you may not have a big team, but have someone else that can sit down with the NOFO, print it out for them, send it to them, have them look at the NOFO and you know have that grant for them to look at. Um, it is important to have consistency. So as much as possible as you can have a lead writer that's also involved in the budgeting and the attachment making process, I will tell you um, a couple of our failures have been where uh, we have, you know, we only are working on the needs narrative and someone else is writing the rest of it, or we're writing the narrative, but someone else at the organization is doing the budget. That is usually something that does not have huge success. You want to make sure someone's involved in every single element of it. And this may be an old school thing. It may make me seem old, but I always print it out, set it down. I have the, I have my grant printed out that's done and I have the, the notice of funding opportunity printed out and start comparing and actually checking and highlighting as you're checking for those boxes. So those, that's my advice on that. Good deal. Um, and as I go through these questions too, if you end up leaving early, there isn't going to be a survey that pops up afterwards and these FAQs will be sent out. So there'll be plenty of options to get these questions answered. But next one that came in was, what is one piece of advice you would give to someone writing their first grant? If you can get your hands on a successful grant, read that. And there are successful grants posted online or, you know, Freedom of Information Act, you can see some federal grants that have been successful. So try to read a successful grant. And also make sure you read every element of that notice of funding opportunity or that announcement. Read it through, read it through again, and read it through again. And then also, if you can have someone who has written a successful grant in the past review it, that would be great. I have people reach out to me, glad to help. Many grant writers are glad to help other people. Grant Professionals Association is a great resource, GPA, maybe become a member of that and someone might be able to help you. Additionally, um, when we offer the Grant Genius class later this year, we will actually, if you finish that, you will actually come out with a full grant that has been edited by my team. So um, that's something else to think about if you have interest in writing your first grant with us. We'd love to have you. Great. Next one is how can you get local partnerships when you're a national organization? And your local may be different. If you're a national organization, let's say that you know, you're the National Association of Grant Professionals. Maybe your local partnership is another national association, but someone you don't think of. It might be the National Association of Community Health Centers because you're gonna write grants to put free books at all the community health centers. It might be a Reach Out and Read Foundation. Um, maybe it's the National Library Foundation. Now libraries are starting to get into behavioral health services. So it may be that you need to think about national organizations and also using, if you're a national organization, I bet at some level there are grassroots, there are local hospitals, there are local members, there are local bands that are that are a part of your national organization. Use them to create some of those local partnerships and then maximize on them. Also, one thing I didn't say about partnerships, don't let geographic areas limit you. Sometimes partnerships can be across state lines, across county lines, across regional boundaries. Think outside the box with that and you can really do amazing things. I was able to be a part of a Kresge Foundation grant that was able to partner. I partnered as an Indiana Federally Qualified Health Center with a Wisconsin Community Health Center. And that was one of the most valuable programs I've ever been a part of. So um, thinking about different things like that is always, is always worthwhile. Next question was, do you have any best practices just to share client success stories? 
Yeah, I think it's just creating that long-term relationship with your client so you actually know and hear about when the things happen. There have been multiple grants that we've received that the client didn't even tell us they got the grant. So always just trying to say from the beginning, hey, we want this to be a long-term relationship. Make sure we know if you get the grant. Um, and then you know, trying to hear from them and capture those success stories. Sometimes we drive there. Um, if you're able to regionally actually drive by the facilities that you've helped, or, you know, when I'm traveling, if I know I'm going to another state and we've written a grant for that state, I will actually drive by that area or try to meet with those people, setting up follow up calls to be able to ask the client what actually happened. But most of my clients are thrilled as soon as they get a grant, they're letting us know some we try to get signed up. So we're on the portal, too. So we get notified if they do get funding. That's a there's a pro tip right there. Um, so, you know, when they do. But just staying in contact and keeping that long-term relationship with clients. So you're able to, to get those success stories. And, you know, many times it is work. I, our goal is always to work on multiple grants with a client, not just to do a, one grant and be done. We want to be part of your whole um, organization and your client team. So that's a way that clients are always willing to share success stories. Um, but again, tracking that information is always a challenge. I agree. Next question that came in, and again, keep these questions coming. They've been great so far. Um, when dealing with a large federal application, do you read the entire thing? Some of them are 50 to 100 pages long with a lot of information that most don't understand. Answer is yes and no. You always have to read every single word at some point, but as you write more and more, you will learn parts you can skip over. Typically, the budget language is always the same, or there are additional manuals they send you to. But you always want to read, and here's another pro tip, read the footnotes. Oftentimes there is very important information in the footnotes. But there is a reason that the federal government has written those applications so long. And you, if you're going to write that grant, it's definitely worthwhile to read every word. Sorry to say, yes, you have to. <laughs> another question is, where is the best place to get data? Would you suggest a county website, a state website, or other suggestions? any and all of the above. I will say when I started in this field, um, data was free. Now you have to pay for a lot of subscriptions, but it is worth it. We use American Community Survey a lot, um, which we pay a membership for. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to me because I don't know it well enough just to rattle it. I just know what we log in and use. So if you have questions and want to get plugged into that, just shoot me an email. Um, but we use all kinds of um, data, state websites, federal websites, uh, because we work in health a lot, we use county health rankings, um, but we go to the county state health departments. Um, we use a lot of federal data, Census Bureau data. Um, so again, always looking for data and also working with your local universities to gather some of that data is also helpful. One of the most challenging bits of information is homelessness data with point in time testing, which often happens here coming up in January, that's always a challenge. And if I could tell you exactly how to get that, I would probably be writing a book about it because again, it's always a challenge just to, to gather all that. Um, also use your organization. Sometimes their data is just as valuable. Schools have a lot of data, free and reduced lunches are put on um, websites. You can gather that data. So again, anywhere you can get it is great. You do want to have reputable sources, though, and you do want to reference those in your grant. Can you give some examples of some larger grants you've been a part of? Oh, my. Well, I just referenced Kresge Foundation, Gates Foundation multiple years ago. Um, I don't work a lot in the tech field, or but now um, we've worked with numerous HRSA grants. I mean, I could go on and on and on and talk all day about large HRSA grants, large SAMHSA grants large USDA grants. Um, I'm trying to think. Those are probably the biggest ones I've been involved with. Those are the ones that we work in the most. Um, large telehealth grants. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, some large from um, Elevance and Anthem Foundation. Those have definitely been many of the larger grants that I've had success with and gotten funding from numerous times. Um, and when I say HRSA, it's usually Brewer Primary Health Care, Office of Rural Health Policy, um, also additionally CDC. We have had a, been working a lot more with the CDC lately as well. 
So do you have tips for the tone of writing? Is it better to sound like a friend telling a story or more formal? It depends on who you're writing to. Um, if it is federal grants or state grants, I usually go for more formality. If it's foundation grants, it can be more informal. Um, I work in healthcare space where it is a little more formal. I know people that work in other spaces sometimes say less formal, but again, I always go for more formal facts. Here's the needs, here's what you're doing, here's how we're gonna address it and make it as formal as possible. Um, that's my method, but there are people who would say, tell a story. You want to be ready to do both. You need to have your quantitative reasons and your qualitative reasons, and you need to have your elevator pitch for both of those because funders do look at things both ways. You also have to, con con uh, you also have to take into consideration that when you're writing a federal grant or even many foundations, local United Ways, they have committees that are doing the selecting. So what might speak to me may be different than what speaks to Hannah. So really you want both your quantitative and qualitative reason, reasons in every grant as much as possible. We'll take a couple more. <clears throat> we have two more um, that have come through so far. I'll wrap up with those two, but if you have any more, shoot us a message and we'll be happy to answer those. So the second to last one is I'm a grants coordinator for a for-profit healthcare system. We are currently getting funding from our local health foundation. Do you have a best practice in finding grant funding for for-profit healthcare organizations? That is more of a challenge. One thing is to potentially set up a nonprofit healthcare foundation that can benefit the for-profit company. And also go talk to your small business development center and your chambers of commerce because there are grants out there for for-profit entities. But I will tell you, I typically do work in the nonprofit space. Also, the opioid settlement funds and many of the tobacco settlement funds were open for for-profit entities. So definitely look there. Um, and we put out a lot of that information um, through our website too. So follow us because we are putting out a lot of that, um, the opioid settlement dollars, because we want you to be a part of that. Perfect. And then last question, I know this is one that we have talked about on our team. Do you suggest doing a full citation, for example, MLA for any data you cite? If so, what format? I mostly work with foundation and corporate grants and never see this as a requirement. There, in fact, this was funny because this is something they talked about, the Grant Professional Association National Conference, that there is no set way to cite with grants. Um, you can pick a method, and as long as you're consistent, MLA, APA, others, I think you're fine. I've not seen anything wrong. I do have some people and clients that have, they swear by having a citation page. Usually we are writing, we want to put that full into the narrative. So we use footnotes or in paragraph citations because we don't want to dedicate pages to sites, but that's really up to you. And I really do think that's a personal choice. I don't believe there is a right or wrong. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I would love to see many of you in our Grant Genius course. Also pass this along to anyone of your friends or family members or people you work with that would be interested. I appreciate your time. Happy writing. Go get some money and let me know. Um, and best of luck to you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank <clears throat> you.